Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar. We will begin the presentation in approximately one minute. Hello, and welcome to How to Extract Actionable Insights with Machine Learning. My name is Chris Greenack, Partner Solutions Architect and Machine Learning Segment Lead for Amazon Web Services, and I will be your host and moderator for today's presentation. When you joined today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone or your computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your audio selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in the control panel. From this control panel, you will also have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions panel. We will collect the questions and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Also, at the end of today's event is a brief survey. Please stay connected until the end of the broadcast and submit your feedback. Your opinions count. Lastly, the PowerPoint presentation will be available through SlideShare, along with a recording of the webinar on YouTube via an email that will be sent two to three days after the conclusion of this event. So keep your eye out and follow up uh, for the follow-up email uh, sent to the address you provided. Again, welcome to today's live seminar, How to Extract Actionable Insights with Machine Learning. My name is Chris Greenack, PSA and Machine Learning Segment Lead for Amazon Web Services. I will be your ho host and moderator for today's webinar. In addition to learning about AWS, we will also hear from Sakin Kulkarni, oops, one sec, there we go, uh, who is the Practice Area Lead and Advanced Analytics at Slalom, Bushoy Grobial, <laughs> sorry Bushoy, CEO and founder of Veripad, and Jason Key, CTO and founder of Veripad. Today you will learn about the machine learning tools at AWS and the AWS stack, how to use machine learning to analyze customer feedback in minutes, how to overcome, oops, uh, sorry about that, um, wrong, <laughs> wrong slide, uh, there we go. How to start using machine learning to do more in less time with greater accuracy. How cloud-based machine learning can add business value and reduce costs. And how to harness advanced analytics and ensure high quality data sets to deliver actionable results. Now remember, please post questions in the chat box throughout this presentation as we will review questions at the end of the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with AWS Machine Learning Services. At Amazon, we've been making investments in machine learning for the past 20 years. If you've used our consumer website, you're certainly familiar with how fast and inexpensive uh, fulfillment and logistics is at AWS. You may not be familiar with these little guys though. These are called Kivas. When you place an order on Amazon uh, retail, uh, one of these guys goes out, uh, finds what you ordered in the warehouse, delivers it to a fulfillment personnel, and gets it to you quite speedily. So these automated uh, devices have advanced over the years, and uh, they've been in production and are used uh, every time you click on amazon.com. Uh, not only that, but of course, we're famous for our recommendation systems and search and discovery on uh, the Amazon website. I'm sure you're familiar with recommended books uh, that have been with the website really since the, the very beginning. Um, and also things like uh, searchable uh, objects and, and items in our media, 
such as on the Kindle. If you drill down in a book on a character, uh, you can identify specific places in the, the book where the reference is found, drill down for other more intelligent uh, references. And in our video media, if you pause on Amazon Prime, uh, we'll actually use computer vision to identify all the characters in a particular scene. This is not metadata that was laid down by some person in a track. We're actually using uh, deep learning algorithms and tying into IMDB, where you can drill in for further information. With all this investment, too, we have generated a whole family of new products, famously the Alexa. Uh, here we see the Amazon Echo and uh, a number of other products uh, that have been developed uh, along the way. Famously, though, now we are creating retail stores where there is literally no cashier. We're using uh, computer vision uh, at the Amazon Go store, which is currently in, in Seattle. And there are many other stores now that are going to be deployed in 2019. Uh, and the way this works is you scan your phone when you walk in the store so we know you're there. And you just go and look for the item that you want, perhaps a sandwich or dessert, as you see here. And when you walk out of the store, there's no cashier. And it kind of feels like shoplifting until you get to the curb and your phone notifies you, you just bought a sandwich and you charge $7. So these and many other advancements in machine learning uh, have been made with Amazon on Amazon and AWS technologies. We've opened up our APIs and our entire platform to tens of thousands of customers who are now running machine learning on AWS today. There are literally not enough pixels on the screen to represent all of the accounts, but these are some of our um, Lighthouse customers. So uh, the way we opened up our stack to uh, all users of AWS um, is described uh, here in this three layered uh, tier. On the top layer, we have our application services. Here with vision, speech, and language, you can access some of the most advanced deep learning algorithms, even if you have no expertise in data science whatsoever. Using recognition image, you can identify objects, uh, do optical character recognition, uh, find personalities, even determine facial uh, sentiment uh, with both static images and video images by just calling the API the way you would call any API at uh, AWS. Uh, we also have Lex and Polly, the powerful speech and text-to-speech engines that are powering Alexa. We have Amazon Transcribe, which will extract text from both MP3s uh, and MP4 movies. We have Translate services now with over a dozen translations available. And Amazon Comprehend, which is a neural topic modeler. And what that means basically is if you give it a corpus of text, it will identify names, key phrases, dates, organizations, and other valuable data that may be sitting in your um, in a corpus of text. So those are all our managed services on the top layer. On the second layer, we have our platform services. Uh, famously here, SageMaker. SageMaker is the premier end-to-end -end model development and model deployment platform. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Deep Lens, which enables uh, developers to very quickly create custom computer vision models. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have here on the far right, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, what we do there is we uh, open up uh, your, well, you can sign up for the service that will label your data. Um, so when you take a look at an image and you see a dog, a cat, a hot dog, et cetera, um, if you can label that data and run it into a machine learning algorithm, it dramatically accelerates both the capabilities and the clarity and accuracy of the models that you're trying to train. Now, I'm using images as an example, but this can be insurance data, healthcare life science, oil and gas, media and entertainment, virtually whatever vertical you're in. Now, this all rests on this extraordinary foundation of hardware technology, including our P3 instances, which have the NVIDIA Volta GPUs that power almost every framework, uh, certainly every popular framework for machine learning that's on the market. Uh, even though 88% of all instances of TensorFlow run on AWS, uh, we take a very non-prescriptive approach to how you may want to develop on AWS, offering the open source Apache MXNet, Cognitive Toolkit from Microsoft, CAFE, 
PyTorch, Keras, um, and others. So SageMaker, I mentioned I'd say a little bit more about uh, SageMaker. SageMaker is really the first end-to-end -end concept to scalable model uh, platform. It's really a fabric of four tightly knit components. First are our notebook instances, which are based on Jupyter and include more than 80 pre-built uh, cut and paste models that you can just cut and paste from uh, our sample notebooks and build your own. Then managed as a completely separate product are built-in algorithms. Um, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, we also have a separate training service because these GPUs you know, are pretty pricey to run. We don't want you to run your notebook instances on those expensive instances. So you can run your notebook on a very inexpensive instance and do your heavy duty GPU training on the training service. Um, finally, we make it easy to deploy these models at scale with a hosting service. So what that looks like is uh, when you're building, you have a Jupyter Notebook um, and these high performance algorithms that are easily built in through an SDK. Uh, one click training where you can take your training job and train it on a separate machine, a cluster of machine, or even, you know, the, there's really almost no practical limit to how many machines you can cluster to accelerate the training of that model. We have automatic hyperparameter tuning, which optimizes your model. Finally, with one click deployment, that could be either from the GUI, from a Python call, or even from uh, the AWS CLI, you can launch a fully managed a persistent endpoint. If you need to create a number of models and you don't need uh, a persistent endpoint, say you just need to call a model maybe for business intelligence once or twice a month or once or twice a week, we have a batch transform service, which essentially does the exact same thing as our fully managed endpoints, but it does it on demand. So uh, some of the companies that are using this include uh, Allied Van Lines, uh, I like to use this example because, you know, who would think uh, a moving service would have need for uh, cutting edge deep learning? But in fact, if you think about the problem of a moving service, there's a lot of logistics. Uh, you need to do forecasting, you have to schedule resources, perhaps buy uh, more capital equipment, um, plan your uh, personnel budget. So there's an enormous amount of operational efficiencies that uh, they use uh, currently to execute their business with optimal efficiency. And of course, we have many others in a, a number of vertical markets, including finance, healthcare, uh, real estate, et cetera. So it is a very broad and easy to use machine learning platform. If you haven't used these products yet, I hope to, uh, today is a, uh, an invitation to do that. Uh, here at AWS, I'm very eager to uh, help our partners advance uh, their way uh, through the partner program. At the very pinnacle of the AWS partner program is the AWS machine learning competency. Now there's a competency for um, a, a couple of other uh, vertical uh, skills, including network security, et cetera. And, but the way these partnership uh, competencies work is as our partners advance through the tiers um, and they finally hit the advanced tier, we will do a hand-selected uh, choice of who the best, who the absolute lighthouse best of our categories uh, are. Um, to get into the competency, it requires uh, an application. Uh, you have to endure a well-architected uh, review where we go through the five pillars of well-architected design, including security, uh, including data governance, um, high reliability, uh, cost optimization, performance, and operational excellence. If you pass all that, we dig deep down into the, the narrow specialty that you do, which is machine learning in this case, where we'll go through your use cases, uh, make sure that they live up to the standard of the absolute pinnacle of the field. Um, if you pass all that, you get into the program. Uh, one of our first uh, partners that made this program is Slalom. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy now to introduce uh, Sakin Kulkarni, the practice area lead of advanced analytics at Slalom. Uh, Sakin, please take it away. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so just going on to the uh, the next slide here. Um, so you know, just a little bit about about me and about Slalom. So so as Chris mentioned, um, you know, I run our um, Advanced analytics practice out of the New York office, um, and you know, really, 
my team is a big user and big proponent of of the AWS platform for for advanced analytics machine learning. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who Slalom is. Um, talk to you about a little bit about what we do and, and give you just an example of a, of a case study that we've worked with in addition to the Veripad story, not to steal all their thunder, but um, kind of talk to you about a case study which we're going to be talking about at AWS reInvent um, in, later on this month. So so our purpose really is to, to help you realize, reach for and realize your vision. Um, we're, we're a purpose-driven consulting firm. Um, you know, really what we look at is, is what are you trying to achieve and how, how can we help you get there? Uh, you know, if you've read a lot about us and, and kind of heard about us, we, we, we love what we do. We love helping our customers and clients and really big, big uh, into the culture that we have. Um, you know, in, ter oops, in terms of our services, um, you, you know, I think we can break it down into, into three different areas. Um, the first one would be, would be strategy. The second one would be transformation. And the, the final one is technology. And sort of all the all the other ones kind of play and and roll up to those. Um, so really, what we're what we're focused on is is not just the technology. So we're you know very strong partners with AWS, which we'll get into later. But you know what is the strategy behind it? What is the operating model behind it? Um, you know how do we create a program around it so you can succeed with your advanced analytics, machine learning initiatives? Um, how do you create devices and experiences that delight your customers? Um, so analytics can be adopted across your organization. So, um, you know, from a, from a services perspective, that's really what we, what we look at. Um, in terms of geography and reach, I, I, I like to joke around that this slide is constantly changing, um, but, you know, we're 5,000 plus consultants. Um, we operate in, in two different ways. The first one is local market design. Um, we believe that consultants um, and clients thrive in, uh, you know, by working side by side in the geographies that they're in. So I, I'm based in the New York area um, and my team is based in New York. And, you know, when Bishoy and I worked together on this project, um, you know, we worked hand in hand because we were close to each other. Um, so we have 25 local markets uh, globally. Um, we also have um, six delivery centers and counting. Um, so delivery centers are where we um, you know, work on our projects for what's now called Slalom Build. So, you know, if you haven't heard about our build program, you should definitely um, look it up. It's a very exciting way to um, generate um, technology assets uh, on an onshore delivery network. So that's a really big part of our strategy moving forward. Um, but we're constantly growing. We're constantly trying to adapt and learn with the market and, um, you know, really excited to continue our growth in the future. So um, our core values, so just really about, you know, what we do, like I said before, we're purpose driven. Um, you know, I'm not going to drain all of these, but I want to pick two that are really important to me. Um, one is doing what is right always. Um, you know, it, it's just about doing what's right for the problem that we have in hand. Um, we, you know, we're not, you know, we don't have an agenda out front. We want to make sure that we do what's right for the customer. And then I think the, the one on the bottom right important is smile. Um, you know, we really believe that having a, a happy workplace and a good workplace is, is the right thing to do. And, and we make sure that all of, our, um, all of our consultants and partners kind of adhere to these core values. So moving on to the machine learning space, um, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of definitions that are thrown around and a lot of, um, you know, people think of machine learning and, and advanced analytics in different ways. Um, you know, we within Slalom and the New York practice think about it in, in this way here. And, and really, it's everything beyond traditional reporting and BI. So just reporting facts in a dashboard is, is really important, but it's not what we consider advanced um, analytics and machine learning. Um, so I like to focus it into these four areas. Uh, the first one is Customer and marketing analytics. I think this is really where we see it the most often. So, um, you know, who are our customers? What are they doing? Um, how do we understand their propensity to buy something? How do we segment and cluster them? How do we cross sell? How do we uh, identify churn and hopefully um, intervene before churn happens? Um, this is huge. This is huge in retail, CPG, media and entertainment, and pharma and financial services, frankly, across all industries. I, I think this is sort of the largest piece of the pie. Um, 
The next one is is forecasting and, and product analytics. So this idea that um, you know what is our future looking like financially? How do we forecast out revenue and sales and profit growth? Um, you know, one of the things that's that's really kind of interesting is as new channels come about, right? You know, from an AWS and it's it's kind of part of his larger umbrella is Amazon.com, right? This this idea that there's new channels of, of e-commerce out there. How do you um, you know, how do you better predict and manage your, your revenue there? And then the the third one is digital uh, analytics. That kind of goes part and parcel with customer, but it's more on sort of the the, the website and device side. Um, it's no longer just retailers who are having, um, you know, e-commerce sites. Um, media and entertainment companies uh, are, are really being in the device space. Um, so, you know, understanding um, how people convert, um, you know, how campaigns uh, should be executed and measured is 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 critical, right? So that's the third one, and the final one is the fourth one is sort of what we are, are touching on here with Veripad, but is is generally one of the smaller parts of the pie, but it's growing fast. Um, is is AI and deep learning? Um, so you know the the use of uh, image recognition, chatbots, natural language processing, and deep learning. So this idea that you know when you have an image of something. Uh, it, it's much harder to process that and, and go through that than it is text data or um, data in columns and rows. So, you know, one of the things I like to bring up is that the fastest growing form of data out there is, is image data. If you think about Snapchat, if you think about Instagram, um, experiences are being captured no longer in words, but in photos, right? So it's this idea that how do you, how do you create better, better learnings from that? Um, and then finally, the, the, there's three sort of foundations that that we like to talk about. The first is from a technology perspective, and this is where AWS comes in. You know, machine learning and, and advanced analytics requires horsepower. Um, it's no longer applicable or you know useful to just have your machine or to use an on-premise data center. Um, the flexibility of the cloud, the flexibility of serverless, allows for um, cost effectiveness. Allows for data scientists to focus on what they do best, which is data science, as opposed to uh, managing infrastructure. So that's one. The second is is org design. Um, you know, uh, data science is a relatively new function. You know, where does it fit within your organization? Is it in a centralized area, decentralized? Um, do you work with partners? Do you hire internally? Um, you know, how do you keep data scientists motivated and how do you keep them going? Um, it's It's a really important thing. And then, and then finally, agile um, data science is experimentation. It's fail fast, um, kind of move along, switch gears. Um, if you're not prepared to do that or invest in that, um, you're going to have kind of a tough wake up call. So it's it's really important to sort of kind of operate in these these key areas. So in in terms of slalom and AWS, um, we. I'd say that we we work so closely and hand in hand. Um, I I think you know the numbers kind of speak for themselves. As as Chris mentioned, the um, you know machine learning competency we were uh, you know honored and privileged to be awarded that this year. Uh, we have you know 500 plus certifications. We've done engagements in 2017 with over 110 people, 110 clients, and I see much more of that this year. Um, we do a lot of partner events. And, um, you know, it's it, the values of Amazon uh, Web Services and Slalom totally align. Um, uh, you know, I, I think some of that you'll see at reInvent, um, but it, it's truly an honor and a um, uh, very exciting privilege to be to be partners with with the AWS ecosystem. So just an example of one of the projects that we did um, in addition to the Veripad story that um, Bishoy um, and Jason will speak about. Um, this is an example of uh, machine learning for a large transportation company. And, um, you know, the example here is, is a case study we'll, we'll be announcing um, at reInvent um, later this month. But, you know, essentially this was a, a large fleet-based uh, vehicle management company that, um, you know, really wanted to understand um, vehicles that should be chosen and prioritized uh, based on efficiency. So, you know, previously they were operating in a mainframe environment. Um, they didn't really have a lot of experience with the cloud. So what we were able to do is build out an overall AWS architecture um, that leveraged, um, you know, machine learning using SageMaker, as um, Chris mentioned. So SageMaker 
um, you know, was used for integer programming, um, getting an idea of which vehicles should be prioritized to be on the lot, um, using mathematical optimization, and we did load balancing versus regression. Um, so what was really interesting here was uh, not only that we built the model, but this is going to be operationalized on the lots. So um, with this, this is a rental car company. Um, it's going to be first deployed to Newark International Airport and globally in 2019 and 2020. So it's really where data science, machine learning meets reality. Um, these are going to be embedded in devices on the front lines. Um, so it's a very exciting, exciting use case. Um, moving along to this next slide, this is just an example of some of the visualizations that that you can use. Um, so this was for this this client um, that we did uh, for a large transportation company. So it's just an idea of. Um, how you can visualize and shuttle your data, uh, look at shuttling uh, efficiently, uh, efficiently, excuse me. Um, so with that, that's that's what I what I have to share. Um, I'm going to pass it along to Bishoy to talk a little bit about um, Veripad and, and how they leverage AWS and Slalom solutions. Thank you so much, Saken. Um, let me see if I have control. There we go. So uh, I'm Shoy. I'm the founder of Veripad, and uh, we worked with uh, Slalom and with AWS a while back to develop our technology for detecting falsified medication. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we do uh, with Veripad, and then Jason, the chief technical officer, will tell you more about our work with AWS and with Slalom. So I started this company because I was born and I was raised in Egypt, where my family would go to pharmacies that look kind of like this to buy their medicine. And when they bought those medicines, sometimes they would work and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, they were sometimes falsified. It was really kind of a, a luck of the draw type thing. Uh, but when I was six, I got this amazing opportunity to come here and live in the United States. And it was an opportunity for everyone, even back home, because every time we went back, we brought with us a very large suitcase full of medicine. And when my family took from that suitcase, they always felt better. And that was, that was really a blessing for everyone. Um, but it's not a blessing that most people in the developing world get to have. Uh, the truth of the matter is that in developing countries, low and middle income countries, up to 30% of medicines on the shelves are falsified. And that's a figure from the uh, World Health Organization, as well as the government of Kenya, where we've done a lot of work. Um, that leads to uh, the pharmaceutical industry losing $200 billion in revenue. That's money that the pharmaceutical industry would have gotten if the pills that were sold uh, were, were genuine and the money went back to them. Um, and what's more striking here is that 1 million people lose their lives from this crisis every year by taking fake medicines or medicines that are cut with something else. Now, I've been talking a lot about um, developing countries, but the United States is not impervious from this. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard of the, the fentanyl crisis that's ravaging the U.S. And that's fentanyl is essentially counterfeit heroin. Uh, people buy heroin thinking it's heroin, but it's, it's uh, fentanyl. Um, people also buy a lot of medicines online nowadays. So... Um, in the Netherlands, you can see that out of 370 samples of online bought Viagra, only 10 were found to be genuine. And big Viagra can stop your heart, essentially. So it's a really big problem that uh, most countries in the world, if, uh, essentially all countries in the world, struggle with uh, in different ways. In Kenya, it's uh, anti-malarials, antibiotics, life-saving medications. Uh, whereas in, developing, in developed countries, it tends to be a different, uh, the problem manifests itself in a different way. So what's Veripad doing to help? Essentially, we created this paper test card. It's kind of like, um, if you can imagine those pool water dipsticks uh, that change color based on what's inside the water, except it changes color based on what's inside the pill. Uh, Jason will walk, walk you through more of the technical details, but the big picture is that you get a color change based on what's inside the pill. And you take a picture with your smartphone app, um, and the smartphone app decodes it using the technology that we built with AWS and uh, Slalom to tell you if this medicine is real or fake. So each of these little colors gives you a different piece of information. The app deciphers it and gives you an answer right away. Fake, real, so you know right then and there. We also gather this data uh, and use it to understand where fake medicines are coming from, where they're going, uh, and work with our big picture partners, the governments that we work with, the pharmaceutical companies that we work with in order to decipher this information, figure out who's making these fake, fake meds so that we can stop it from getting on the market in the first place. So this is several unique characteristics of technology uh, that don't exist in other places. We do chemical testing. We don't 
tell you where the barcode came from or any of the track and trace type things. We tell you the chemical contents, which is really valuable here. Um, we use a paper. Um, so this paper is it's just a printed technology. It's incredibly low cost um, and easy to manufacture. So we can produce a lot of these very cheaply and very quickly. Uh, and that adds to the portability of it. I've done testing in very remote places. All you need is just some water and this piece of paper and the smartphone app. And you get connectivity throughout low and middle income countries. Smartphones are very prevalent in these poor countries as well. Um, so it really enables high tech using low tech. Um, and that's kind of the value here. And that's all because of the machine learning that's behind it. You don't need to train an individual on how to read this complicated chemistry. You just take a picture and the app does it for you. That's, an, that's incredibly powerful. And that's what really allows this technology to scale. You don't need an education. You don't need any high tech. You could do something that previously you had to do in a lab, in the mountains, in the field, wherever, uh, wherever you need to do it uh, at the point of sale, at the point of care. So we have a, an amazing team uh, that's been working with us. Uh, I founded this company with my co-founder, Dawi, uh, and our chief technical officer, Jason, has been working very closely uh, with Slalom and AWS to create this technology that I've been mentioning. Um, and I'll allow Jason to now uh, go ahead and tell us how we got to where we are on the technology front. Go ahead, Jason. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Michelle. So my name is Jason Key. I'm the CTO and tech lead at BirdPad, where I'm responsible for building image analysis technology and mobile application for the paper analytical devices. Uh, so we utilize uh, computer vision and machine learning methods for performing classification of drugs and doing low-level analysis of chemical ingredients that are inside it. So we're testing for both the authenticity and the quality of the given drug. So first, uh, in this talk, I'll start out by describing about our PET technology. Uh, then I will talk about the work we did with Solomon's data scientists and how we leverage uh, Amazon Web Service tools to uh, improve our tech stack. So as Bishoy mentioned, uh, the PETs or paper analytical devices are a cheap and quick way to perform uh, doing chemical composition testing. So this PET was uh, produced by Dr. Maria Lieberman at University of Notre Dame uh, with the research initially funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And since then, uh, several other NSF and NIH related grants. So the PADS utilize a uh, color metric for identifying chemical compounds in the drug. Color metric analysis is a method of determining the concentration of a chemical ingredient or chemical comp compound in a solution with the aid of a color reagent. So imagine that every drug is a unique color fingerprint and the PADS are used to identify the key chemical signature inside of them. So we're looking for changes of color reagents based on the common uh, API, which is stands for active pharmaceutical ingredients, or common fillers, such as cornstarch, uh, which is used to lace a given drug for producing counterfeits or cheaper but lower quality medication. A commonly counterfeited drugs are antibacterial drugs such as amoxicillin, which are used to treat stomach infections, or, anti or antimalarial drugs such as chloroquine, uh, which are used to treat malaria. So stomach infections or parasitic related illnesses are easily treatable with the right medication, but yet they are still one of the leading causes of death uh, in developing nations due to the lack of access to quality medica medication. Um, so this next slide uh, briefly discusses about how to use the PADS. So first, you get a sample of drug that you're interested in testing for quality. Take the sample, crush it up into a powder, and then apply the powder and press it onto the middle of the paper cards where the arrows are pointing. After carefully applying the powder, dip the bottom of the cards into the water. Water will then permeate through the paper card, uh, travel up, dissolving the drug, and the dissolved solvents of the drug will travel up with the water, and it will then react with the printed chemical reagents on the card, and the, and the colors will change based on the chemical ingredients inside the drugs. So prior to our uh, tech development using machine learning, users would need to evaluate the results of, of each test cards by visually comparing the paths to uh, uh, stored images of cards run with standard pharmaceutical samples previously. Uh, so reading the cards is much more challenging than it appears. So you can see based on the human reading example of the lanes on the left, uh, there can be dis discrepancies and errors may incur uh, in reading these cards. 
And the important differences in the color tones are not always picked up. And moreover, the time and the effort required to train people to read the cards correctly and verify their capability is a barrier to wider scaling of the use of cards. So to tackle this, we have developed a visual recognition system which uh, can classify uh, the pet images based on the pharmaceutical drugs being tested. The users can get analysis of their, uh, their test cards through her, his or her cell phones, uh, and the system will quickly return a quality score of, the, of a given drug back to the user. So this next slide describes the process of how the mobile app works. Um, so first, automatic detection and image acquisition of uh, the pad images are done by the mobile app, and it's rectified and gets sent back to the back end for image analysis and prediction. So today, we want to go into describing how we improved on our image uh, analysis technology during our partnership work with um, Solum and AWS. So the analysis of pad is a computer vision problem. The goal is to find and extract a set of important image features of the pad images for a given drug and to be able to give a quality score of a given drug by identifying the, identifying the color changes of active ingredients or the common fillers that are inside. So we describe the difficulties of analyzing the pads of human readers as users are prone to just making errors due to numerous reasons. The visual recognition problem uh, becomes even more difficult when you consider that uh, these active pharmaceutical ingredients are all available in different strengths and a given drug is manufactured by a different companies with each with discrepancies in ingredients in which they use. So the tech development of our company first uh, started by doing these sort of high level analysis where we give a prediction score for a given drug. <clears throat> so a data set of cars embedded with these reagents is produced to regenerate the most distinctive results for a set of uh, uh, 26 to 30 different uh, pharmaceutical uh, drugs. And then we train uh, image prediction model using the popular, the popular convolutional neural networks. And using this model, we were able to identify the label of a given drug with over 82% accuracy on 200 pad images of samples collected from pharmacies in Kenya. So this is a really good uh, metric uh, as these are real world samples uh, collected in the field and then not in a controlled lab setting. Um, so this is good, but we asked ourselves, can we do a better prediction? Uh, can we improve our analysis? And can we also do a low level analysis in which not only uh, can we learn the classification of these drugs, but also learn the chemical composition using machine learning? So this is uh, where our work with Solemn mainly came in. So from here, the most of the time uh, with Solomon was devoted to in developing these uh, low-level techniques for extracting features. Uh, so in order to get a more specific information of the drug, we needed to be able to analyze and quantify each of the 12 different chemical reagent lanes printed on the pads. Uh, this required extraction of uh, handcrafted features. A dumb way of doing this is to hard code and pick the uh, pick color changes and based on the positioning and the color intensity. But of course, this is an inefficient way, and we cannot possibly detect all possible features that are important for, let's say, 60 different drugs. So here, we employed a, a lot of different image decomposition and computer vision techniques uh, to extract uh, each, um, each lane. So I'll briefly go over what we've done. Uh, this is getting a little bit technical. So Bear with me. So first, we dissect, dissect each lane. We, uh, we pre-process the lane to correct for color, uh, and we rectify them. And then we identify the blobs of interest uh, within each lane using various uh, uh, clustering and like uh, decomposition algorithms. Um, so this allows us to basically divide uh, each region based on the color signatures for a given drug. So Using this newly developed method with slalom, uh, we improved our accuracy above 97%. And moreover, we were able to uh, dissect uh, the chemical ingredients that are within the drug. So now we're able to give a more low level insight about what's actually inside the drug rather than just giving a single uh, classification score of what that drug could be. 
So, <clears throat> so these are very highly encouraging results, and we are still currently in process of uh, deploying this new method into our backend system. Uh, so hopefully that will be uh, finished within the end of the year. So overall, we were very satisfied with the work that we've done with Slalom. It was, a, it was overall very productive and smooth experience. Uh, all the people at Slalom were very flexible, and they, they really tried to best understand our needs and cater to our particular company and our machine learning problems. So lastly, I want to talk briefly about uh, how we were introduced to some of the uh, AWS services and how we since changed our tech stack and machine learning e ecosystem. So Slalom co consultants emphasize the use of Amazon SageMaker for uh, writing, training, and deploying our models onto the SageMaker's uh, platform. And since then, we uh, are using from end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, from writing to deploying the codes on SageMaker, actually. Um, and moreover, we revamped our backend system for a client and host system for mobile app by changing up our entire uh, backend stack. So now we use S3 for hosting all our image data, and we utilize uh, Amazon Lambda for interfacing between our mobile app and the backend and our machine learning model uh, using the SageMaker. And this has uh, significantly reduced our development time and increased our efficiency. Uh, and we no longer have to uh, worry about the minute details about uh, finding the proper uh, GPUs, um, finding the proper cloud service system to use, where Amazon basically took care of all of this uh, into a simple web stack uh, that you can access by just a Chrome browser. So, so with that, uh, uh, wrap up of our tech. I'll send it back to be sure to summarize about our, our company's trajectory, and he will discuss a bit more about the ongoing projects and our partnership. Wrap up this segment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah. Uh, so we've uh, we've gotten tremendous value from our work with Slalom. Our app came in one way and came out another way, and that's that's really. Um, it's really big for us because uh, the app is really what changes the game, as I mentioned earlier. It makes uh, it makes it such that you don't need to train people because um, the app does the heavy lifting of decoding uh, all this chemical information into something that you can take actions from. Um, so what we're trying to do right now is is take that app and, and retest it. So we had originally done pilots with the Kenyan government and um, organizations out uh, in the Philippines where we're testing fake medicines. We've been testing. We've been testing for fake medicines uh, throughout the world, and now we're excited to do the phase twos of several of those projects. So uh, the next, the immediate next steps will be um, to upgrade our manufacturing facility so we can get some of the hardware ready to go. Uh, in the meantime, also updating the app so that we can launch our phase two pilots in the beginning of next year. Um, that's the that's the immediate next step, and that will be the first one will be with the. The Kenyan government, the next phase of that, as well as with AmeriCares, which is an organization we're working out, working with out of the Philippines. Uh, also, since uh, since we've worked with Salem afterwards, we were able to secure another pilot uh, with uh, a multinational effort uh, in West Africa with Ghana and Nigeria. So that's where we're working right now. We're really excited to get that up and going, uh, to get that actionable insight to, to figure out where these fake medicines are coming from and, and to take them off of the streets. Um, we're also uh, really uh, excited to continue with, um, right now we've been focusing primarily in low and middle income countries because that's where we believe the majority of the work needs to be done uh, because people are dying from these fake medicines. Uh, but we also uh, know that there is um, an opportunity here in the United States and in developed countries, uh, as I mentioned with fentanyl, which is ravaging the United States, as well as with online bot medicines as well. So we're working to develop the hardware and the software uh, such that we can tackle that problem as well. We are a startup, we are raising money, and we are also looking for uh, collaborations and, and uh, strategic partnerships. So um, this, by no means are we the silver bullet to this problem. Uh, we work with other companies in this space uh, because fake medicines come in different ways and different um, present differently. So we like to work with governments, we like to work with pharmaceutical companies. We've been sponsored by Merck and work with them um, for a couple of years now. Um, and we also want to work with any of you who are interested or in, uh, or players in this field. Uh, so 
in the health tech field, if you know anyone who is in this sphere uh, who can benefit from this technology, who has a thoughts on this technology, we'd love to hear from you. Um, because if you believe in our mission and you want to take these fake meds off the market, we'd love to work with you. So that's all we got. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll take, and Chris will facilitate uh, any questions that we have. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Bashoy. What a fascinating use case. Uh, so just a quick reminder, uh, we are going, we're in the Q&A section of our program now, and we've gotten quite a few questions here. Uh, some of them are for me, uh, so uh, I'll kick that off. Um, and the question comes in uh, worded this way. Uh, if I have applications running in an AWS environment and I want to apply machine learning techniques to track user behavior and trends within various apps, is there an Amazon option available to me to facilitate that? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, please do take some time uh, to go through the Amazon the AWS console uh, and investigate our analytics options. Uh, by default, you're going to get a lot of logging from uh, our managed services and, and the behaviors uh, that, that just happen when you're using um, the behaviors. But when you add analytics to your uh, mobile hub uh, applications, uh, to anything that's running on IoT Greengrass, um, any of the analytics that are available uh, through uh, Amplify, for example, um, or any of the other cloud and web-based uh, analytic systems that we have, frankly, too many to mention. Um, you will begin to develop a corpus of machine learning uh, uh, data sets that can be used to do all kinds of things. Uh, you could take your transaction logs and cluster them. Um, you can begin to discover uh, discrete groups uh, which I like to call analytic, uh, um, rather algorithmic personas. Uh, so the short story is yes, it's way beyond the scope of just a, a Q&A here. Um, what I'd ask you to do first, though, is to turn on the analytics in the apps that manage services themselves uh, that you're using. Uh, next question, uh, once again for AWS, uh, do you offer customized P3 instances? I'm developing my own deep learning models and I need a lot of GPU memory. Well, there are 64 gig available on each of the v, uh, V100 NVIDIA GPUs that come in the P3s. However, my guess is you need to grow beyond a single GPU. Uh, take a look at the way that uh, we have um, set up SageMaker to manage memory for you. You can easily grow not only out of a single GPU, but out of your machine itself. So there's eight GPUs in uh, our biggest P3 instance. So that's uh, eight times 64, but you can easily grow out of that machine into a cluster of machines when using SageMaker. Um, once again, beyond the scope of this call uh, to go into that, but it's pretty well documented and Julian Simon, our uh, SageMaker evangelist, if you check out some of his uh, videos on YouTube. Um, first of all, he's really entertaining, great guy. Check out his blogs, um, his Medium articles, et cetera. Uh, one comment comes in, uh, frankly, this was the impression I had. Uh, he says simply, this, that is outstanding. I worked for Abbott Labs in the past, and this is great. So uh, really do appreciate that compliment. How does AWS machine learning platform distinguish from others? Uh, I'm gonna hand this off to Slalom. Uh, in the transportation use case, did Slalom explore yeah. alternate ways to achieve pr the predictive analytics? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, I think that, so the, let's take the transportation example we did. So I, I think what, what Amazon has been great about is they're first to the market. So the SageMaker algorithm, well, first of all, the kind of uh, more built-in uh, advanced analytics, machine learning, Lex, Poly, et cetera, were really first of its kind. But the fact that SageMaker was, was much more advanced than some of the other providers that we were looking at. So um, we were really sort of impressed by, by Amazon's breadth there um, and depth as well. So um, I, I think that's just the, the main thing is, is the, the fact that it's been so innovative and really that the, the real reason for that is um, if you just look at how Amazon runs its business, it's so data driven and, you know, the recommendation engines and et cetera. Um, that's really what, what pushed it over the edge. Great. And the question uh, continued regarding uh, the predictive analytics in the transportation use case. Sure. 
Sure. So, sorry, sorry. What was the exact question? Uh, so it says, did slalom explore alternate ways to achieve the predictive analytics? Yeah. So, so in this example, it was actually a, a customer that that was evaluating slalom in AWS versus another provider, and um, you know, we we looked at possibly doing things um, locally. We looked at other uh, providers, but it was really the the fact that the advances in um, AWS technology was the big one, and and just the fact that. Um, it needed to be serverless and needed to be cloud in order to scale. We were dealing with with large, large volumes of data. A lot of them were from connected vehicles. Um, it was real time or near real time. So that that was really the main reason. So we did look at others, but we, we chose Amazon for this one. Fantastic. Um, I, I think this question probably came before you brought it up, but for Veripad here, have you spoken with the Bill Gates Foundation? This would fit into their world, uh, world health initiatives. You may want to have more to say about that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we have uh, worked with um, Bill and Melinda Gates. They funded the initial research, um, and we're continuing to apply to several of their grants as well. Uh, they've been great partners, and they've been very supportive. Thank you. And uh, again, for Veripad, out of curiosity, uh, what type of paper is needed for uh, accurate readings? It's a great question. Uh, it's a cellulose-based paper. Um, it's not regular uh, like printer-type paper. Uh, the, interest, the important thing there is the pore diameter, uh, such that the water can travel up and mix the reagents properly. Um, some of these molecules tend to be quite large. Um, so it's, it's a special type of paper. Yeah. And, and there's a follow-up question here. Would varying types of paper provide inaccurate readings? So because we manufacture the technology ourselves, uh, the hardware, we can control for that. Um, we do, uh, we have tried several types of papers. Uh, we settled on this one a while back uh, and have not kind of re, uh, revisited that topic. Uh, it is, depending on the how the, the water spreads across the paper, you can get different readings. But if you are trained, um, an individual who knows what they're looking for can uh, tell between those differences. We haven't trained the algorithm uh, on different papers because we want to eliminate that such that we can uh, reduce the noise in the, you know, in the analysis there. Uh, but you're right, different papers would provide slightly different results. And now um, back to slalom. Uh, does slalom work with small startups? Yeah, yeah. So we we work with companies of all sizes. I mean, Veripad. I hope they're not insulted by calling them a small startup, but they're they're a small startup, and we work with them. Um, we we absolutely do. So if you uh, you know are interested in working with us, um, feel free to to contact me uh, or Chris, and I'm happy to have a conversation. Okay. Uh, when considering anomaly detection, is there a trend towards custom built internal solutions? or implementation of packaged and cloud tools? Uh, Chris, do you want to take this or do you want me to take it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, you're the star of the show, so please. Uh, I, if I have a follow-up okay. comment, I'm happy to make it, but, but please, uh, regarding okay. anomaly detection, yeah. Yeah, sure, so I, I think, you know, anomaly detection is funny, it's, it's one of the most classic ways to do it is is um, what we call peer group analysis and and kind of deviation from the norm. So if you think about it, this may be a little long winded, so I'm going to keep it kind of brief. So um, you know, if you think about all the people that are in your building or office or class or whatever you have, you, you, if you use a clustering algorithm to break it down into individual groups and then you measure those people's performance over time, right? So a very classic example is if um, somebody's performing some sort of fraud, right? Whether it's sales fraud or mail fraud. Um, if you kind of group people and monitor spikes in behaviors, um, you know, you can capture that. So I, I think actually a lot of really classic um, peer group analysis and clustering algorithms have been really good uh, for anomaly detection and fraud detection. It's what we use with this um, transportation company. Um, it's pretty good. I, I think that, you know, a few times you can, you can build your own. Um, I, I think, though, what I've seen and just something you want to caution is um, we have a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of examples where people sort of build things and um, it doesn't go according to plan because they really just want to use deep learning or they want to use some sort of technique that they've read about. So I, I would say as much as you can use sort of the 
the, the methodology that have really been best of breed. Um, they may not be the, the sexiest ones out there, but they've been successful over the years. So, so that, that would be my advice. Great. Uh, so can I, I think I'll just add one more thing to this. You, you really need to work with some people that have previous expertise like slalom. Uh, and, and here's why. Um, package solution. Well, here's uh, let me step back from even what I was just about to say. Uh, explaining fraud or anomaly detection is simple. Uh, the problem is point solutions are unique to the problem at hand. Um, what I'm uh, starting to see is you have people start off with clustering, but then based on their level of expertise, they'll create pipelines that maybe start with, you know, shallow learning. Uh, and depending on whether they're doing, you know, some kind of uh, IoT-based anomaly detection in, in manufacturing, um, you know, they'll, they'll resort then to autoencoders, which are a form of uh, deep learning technique. Um, in finance, uh, once again, you know, you, you may use shallow learning just to get the original signal, and then you'll move into other techniques that might even be available through things like the Spark ML Lib. Um, and the question is, how do you know about the breadth of those point solutions, except if you look at these problems, you know, uh, all day, every day by the dozens? Uh, so that's where having an, an expert consultancy is, is worth, you know, every single penny and, and, and just really worth it. Uh, okay, next up, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this is a follow-up to the small startups question. To elaborate, does small, uh, Slalom do blueprinting for small startups to spec out data architecture? Yeah, so we we do so you know we do a wide variety of of services um, from data science build is what we, what we did for Veripad to actually creating the overall architecture or the strategy behind it. So um, yeah, I mean, we, we kind of uh, encompass all of those areas. We also do data visualization. We're a strong uh, partner of Tableau and Click and Power BI. So, um, you know, we, we, we do all those kinds of uh, services as well. Okay, next up. Uh, a lot of Amazon questions today. Uh, is there an Amazon option for automatically testing correlations between multiple variables? For example, feed a data set and have it automatically test the statistical significance to return p-values greater than five. Um, so, uh, you know, check out the SageMaker built-in algorithms. Uh, just go straight to k-means clustering. Um, you can easily stand up any uh, in, in TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, et cetera. You can easily stand up um, uh, not just clustering algorithms, but also, um, uh, you know, SVMs or uh, any of the uh, techniques that do this kind of correlated analysis. Um, I will say this, uh, we make the tools that build race cars. You build the race cars, we make the tools. So when you're looking for point solutions, we have every tool you need, but you have to build it on the tools that we're providing. I hope that um, analogy makes sense. All right, uh, this looks like it's back to Veripad. Uh, for heroin fentanyl testing, who is the intended audience? Are drug users likely to sacrifice any of their product for testing? That is a, a great question, <clears throat> once again. Uh, so we're, uh, we're exploring different types of uh, partners here. We have discussed with policing agencies in the United States to test them. What they currently use is kind of a, like a red for heroin, blue for fentanyl, uh, blue for not heroin type thing. Um, and we want to kind of give them a few more options. Uh, instead of just a yes or no, we have a, a whole array of chemical testing on one paper. So we have discussed that with them and working to see if we can incorporate that into what they do testing on uh, in the field. Um, <clears throat> we would love it if um, users themselves would be would uh, want to use it, uh, but we don't we don't know that they do. Uh, you're right. Uh, giving up even a portion of that can be an issue. Uh, so we are exploring different things, but the best lead we have right now is policing agencies. So I believe we're coming up to our uh, last question here, just because we're top of the hour. Um, actually, let's try to squeeze in two. So the penultimate question uh, uh, for Sloan, what kind of budget does a startup need to implement a machine learning solution? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I mean, we you know, who, I, I'm assuming that the the men or woman who's asking this is is probably the same person in the thread. So 
Um, you know, I, I don't think it takes as much as you would think. Um, with the Veripad example, um, we did this over a, a four four to six week period initially. So it's um, given that you, you know the AWS platform provides all the algorithms in house, um, it could be done fairly rapidly. Um, it does require a lot of focus and attention by folks on your team. So so that's really the the, the main part of it. But I, I I think it's I think it's manageable even um, for a startup as well. Great. And last, it uh, looks like it's for AWS. Does SageMaker's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, does SageMaker, oh, I'm having trouble reading this one. Uh, sorry about that. Does SageMaker's algorithms uh, feature come with pre-built dictionaries like Python and R may offer? How does SageMaker differ? And can you provide an example of why SageMaker is represented as easy to use? <laughs> okay, so the short story is, uh, we have a separate product product manager for our built-in algorithms, and there's a uh, it's pretty well documented um, both on uh, our webcasts, um, in YouTube, and and online in our blogs. We do not seek to uh, replicate what's already available in Python, in uh, TensorFlow, um, or uh, even Scikit-Learn, and things like that. Those tools are all already available. The built-in algorithms are all built on a philosophy that uh, with our uh, knowledge of the AWS infrastructure, we can provide more up to and more than 10 times the performance uh, for typical algorithms. So these are the algorithms that you need like our linear learner, XGBoost, um, et cetera. So uh, explore the SageMaker examples. Um, and if you bring up SageMaker, it's free to just browse. Um, if you bring up SageMaker um, or even check out the GitHub repo, SageMaker examples, where all of the uh, uh, all the built-in algorithms and, and SageMaker um, uh, notebooks are available for just browsing, you can even do a pull request. You can see how we do um, essentially everything there. So I don't know what's easier to use than having a, a notebook where you just hit shift return and deploy in the cloud, but that's pretty darn easy. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for a, a compelling webinar. And thank you to all for attending today. Uh, please remember to stay connected and complete the brief survey at the conclusion of this webinar. We look forward to supporting you in current and future projects. Thank you again, and have a great day.